Hi, my name is Molly Hayden. I'm the business manager here at HSG. You may recognize my voice from the WaverWise intros. Today, we're doing something a little bit different. Now that we've discussed the information contained in the waiver, it's time to start thinking about the application of its contents. Many of you out there may be thinking, how does the 1115 apply to my organization? And today we're aiming to help you with that. I'm here today with Jason Halgerson, HSG's founder and CEO, to find out more. Hi, Jason. Hey, Molly. Good to see you. So I'm curious. If an organization provides a service that isn't listed under either level one or level two services, does that mean that New York State won't reimburse for those? Yeah, good question. And and this has been coming up quite a bit in our various conversations around the state as people are lo- looking at the documents that the state and the federal government have put out there, looking for opportunities to expand what they do, or in some cases, get funded for what they do for the Medicaid members that they serve. And a lot of people are focusing on those words. What what specific services are delineated either as a level two or level one services? So do they provide case management? Do they provide housing support? Do they provide nutrition, transportation, and such? And the answer is that while those are, in fact, the covered services and those are the only covered services, there are some interesting opportunities embedded in this new program to actually get things that aren't specifically delineated actually funded, or at least partially funded, through these health-related social needs services. Some of the -the out-of-the-box thinking that I know some organizations are are starting to go down. My example is, let's take peer support specialists. A lot of us have been advocates for trying to fund on a systematic, at-scale manner, peer support specialists. These are individuals who have lived experience, particularly for people with significant and persistent mental illness or substance use disorder, who oftentimes can connect with individuals facing similar challenges far more effectively than than a clinical social worker or a physician or a psychologist or psychiatrist. And while we have looked for ways to sort of, quote unquote, fund these peer support specialists, it's really been a struggle. There's been some pilot programs, uh, plans have done some things, certain services, in fact, have been made eligible for certain small subpopulations. But the way I look at it is, is that while peer support specialists are not specifically mentioned as a health-related social need, I think we could actually reimagine how peer support specialists actually operate. And actually, to start seeing them as operating in almost a practice model, and seeing how they could potentially provide health-related social needs and bill for those services and bill appropriately, and through that, generate adequate income to cover their costs. The parallel here, the way to maybe think about what that practice model would look like is is a primary care provider. Uh, Primary care providers, particularly in a fee-for-service environment, they don't bill for quote-unquote primary care services. They don't get paid by the day for the services that they provide or by the hour Rather, there are specific codes, billing codes that in healthcare fee for service that they can bill. And the idea is that by billing those services or providing those services and billing, they generate enough revenue to cover their costs. Could we imagine a world in which a, a practice a group of maybe an agency or a group of peer specialists are providing some mix of case management, housing, nutritional support, transportation services, and they're providing those services appropriately, billing for those individual units of service appropriately. But that those those billings generate enough revenue to cover their full costs. And in essence, cross subsidize some of the other work, maybe the less you know, service work that's not billable, but covers some of those services and covers the cost of providing that full scope of of services that they want to provide. So I think there are some interesting and exciting opportunities here. If you sort of think creatively, think out of the box and see these uh, programs and services, maybe not as a single funding source for a team of individuals, but cobbling together services that meet the needs of individuals. Because I think, as we know, say people with significant persistent mental illness, which is a eligible population under the waiver, they have many needs. And those needs include the need for case management services, the need for housing support. Many of them are at imminent risk of losing their housing and a peer support specialist can help them with that. Nutritional support potentially as well, as well as helping access of various forms of transportation. So we don't yet know what the state's going to pay in terms of rates of reimbursement for these services. We probably will know that within the next few weeks. But I'm hopeful at the end of the day, there'll be some real opportunities 
to maybe reimagine how thing, services like peer support specialists, imagine them less as looking for a single billing code, but looking at them as a provider who provides a mix of services and those individual services are in fact billable. But that's the kind of out of the box thinking that I think this is going to require. As I've said before, the waiver itself doesn't necessarily solve problems, but is really a tool to solving some of the more complex health and social problems that have challenged the Medicaid population for a long time. And I think it's really up to all of us who care about the population, care about their need, meeting their needs in a creative way to come up with really creative solutions to use these resources, to use these funds in the most effective way possible. Thank you, Jason. That's great. So it's really making the waiver work for you and your organization. Yeah. And and most importantly, for the individuals you serve. And I think that's really the goal here. You know, in my world, as an advocate for value-based care and contracting, this very fee-for-service, you provide a unit of service to an eligible person in the appropriate way and then bill for that per unit of service provided, maybe isn't necessarily the way I would have done it, but it is the way that I think particularly the federal government wants to do it. And so I think we need to understand that and design methods of providing services that will make the most of this funding source. And I think there's a lot of creative, interesting opportunities uh, to make that possible. Great. Thank you so much. If folks want to learn more about opportunities like this, how can they contact you? Well, come to our website, send us an email, reach out. We would love to hear more about what you're thinking, what your opportunities are that you see. We are working with a variety of different organizations across the state and across the continuum of services, helping them think through creatively how to make the most of this waiver opportunity. It really is a very, very exciting time in New York, and we're excited to look for opportunities to work with organizations who want to make the most of it.